Hello, brothers and sisters. I trust that by the grace of God, you are doing fine. Jesus told his disciples a parable in Matthew 13, 45 and 46. He said, The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. In this parable, Jesus speaks of a merchant man seeking pearls. He's a man who understands his trade. He has been in business long enough to recognize a valuable pearl when he sees it. No doubt he has bought and sold many pearls throughout his time in business. However, his endeavors have not provided complete satisfaction. He has never found the pearl that satisfied his longing to find that one real jewel. So as he buys and sells countless pearls, he continues to seek that one real jewel that will put an end to his search. Is that not how we and countless other believers lived prior to coming to Christ in salvation? Some try various forms of religion. They attempt to satisfy the longing in their souls with the pleasures of life or through sacrificial service to others. They may even attend a Bible-believing church being active and committed to its services and activities, seeking to find what they are looking for to bring real peace and contentment. Sadly, there is nothing in this world that can fully satisfy the longing man has within his soul. That need can only be met by Christ alone. Jesus doesn't reveal how long this man has been in business or where his search has taken him. We know nothing of the number of pearls he had bought and sold in the past. We know nothing of where, of where his desires have taken him. All we know is the search continues. Surely he has seen some of the best pearls known to man. He has handled many valuable pearls that have brought satisfaction to others. And yet, his search continues. The merchant man is consumed with his pursuit of finding that perfect pearl. He has owned and traded so many, no doubt he will recognize it immediately when it is finally found. Now our world is filled with many who spend their entire lives searching for that one thing that will make their lives complete, bringing purpose, peace, security, great joy. Some may not want to admit it, but we are all spiritual beings. God created us that way. There is an inborn desire to worship. We all contemplate death and what lies beyond the grave. Many go from one organization, religion, or activity to another, searching for purpose and meaning. Now this merchant man in his continual relentless search finally discovered one pearl of great price. There was no question of its value. He immediately knew this was the one he had searched for his entire life. This particular pearl was prized above all others. He had never encountered another pearl that rivaled the beauty or worth of this pearl. For the merchant, this was the discovery of a lifetime and he knew his search was over. Like the merchant man, I and countless others have made this discovery. As a young boy, I too found the pearl of great price. It was immediately recognizable, even to an immature boy. This pearl exceeded the splendor and beauty of anything I had ever encountered. As the Holy Spirit revealed Christ the Lord to me, I recognized that He alone could meet my need, save my soul, and reconcile me to the Holy God. I was overwhelmed with joy at my discovery. My search had ended. However, I must confess that I was not actively seeking the pearl of great price the day I discovered him. I know that the sovereignty of God led me to Christ to the direction of the Spirit. After this glorious discovery, I immediately knew I had found what my soul longed for. 
the merchant immediately recognized the value of this particular pearl. He knew he could not let it slip out of his grasp. This is the one he had searched for his entire life. So he sold everything he owned in order to purchase and possess this single pearl. It proved to be more valuable than anything else he possessed. In fact, this pearl was worth more than everything else he owned combined. Consider the excitement the merchant must have felt at this moment. He had spent his entire, entire life searching for the one pearl of great price. And finally, he found it. He was able to purchase it. Now, the jewel that he had long sought belonged to him. Knowing the value of this pearl, I am sure the merchant felt secure in his future. He now owned a pearl that would provide for whatever needs he might encounter. His valuable possession offered unrivaled security. The same is true for every believer. Those who have been saved by grace, being placed in the body of Christ, have a possession that will meet every need they have. Now, of course, I'm not saying that we won't have financial struggles or face difficulties in this life. But the saved ones have a possession that will endure beyond the grave and grant access to eternal life in heaven. We will spend eternity with Christ our Lord because of His good grace and our relationship with Him. Of all that I possess, nothing else offers the security of salvation in Christ. My eternal destiny is settled and secured in Christ Jesus my Lord. The point of the parable of Jesus here is to highlight indeed the infinite precious worth of knowing Jesus and being known by Him. The man sold everything to have this treasure. He gave up his home, his furniture, his livestock, anything that he had, any value. He sacrificed things he had made, gifts that had been given to him perhaps, possessions he had accumulated for years and years. He said goodbye to it all in an instant. And he did so because he could see what we, he would gain with far surprise surpass everything he'd ever owned up until that point. Would you sell everything you own to have Jesus? If we do not love and treasure Jesus like this, then we do not know Him. Everlasting life in Him and with Him is simply an undeniable worth of treasure more than anything else we can buy or build or obtain here on earth. Massive homes are nothing. Beautiful, expensive cars are nothing. Clothing, hobbies, pets, Apple products and gadgets perhaps, books, careers, businesses, all nothing. Even our loved ones are nothing compared with our Christ. He is worth all to us. So brethren, let us take a moment to thank the Lord for His goodness and grace and mercy in our lives. By God's abounding grace and infinite mercy, we have found Christ the pearl of great price, most precious possession, a treasure, the greatest treasure a man can ever have. As an old hymn sings, Jesus is all the world to me. My life, my joy, He'll always be. Beautiful life with such a friend. Beautiful life that has no end. Brethren, let's lift up our voices to praise our most precious Lord. Oh, hallelujah. All I have is Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus is my life. Yet thought I knew the way 
the sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will. And if you had not loved me first, I would refuse.
Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. Whatever we give up for God is nothing compared to the great value and great joy of knowing and following Jesus. Oh yes, Lord, our souls are satisfied in Christ alone. Life in you is indeed a beautiful life that has no end. We are eagerly looking forward for the day when you finally call us to be with you in our eternal home. In the meantime, we pray, we desire, that we will be faithful unto you. In Christ we pray. Amen. A blessed day to you all. In the absence of a clear directive and plan from the government about gathering in churches in the face of this crisis, we have had to listen to the news 
and announcements regularly. Since we do not know what the basis is for allowing to churches to gather, and when an announcement, if any, would be made, it makes it difficult to for those of us involved in the recording of our worship services to plan the week ahead. I mention this because this is one of the challenges in putting this recording together. How I wish there is a clear direction and plan for the churches, for as we all know, gathered worship is essential. Now having mentioned the recording of our worship services, I think that it is not known to many of you that there is a team of men and women involved in the production of our online worship services each week. So given the uncertainty of our situation, I am not the only one who is unable to make concrete plans for the week. They too find themselves on tender hooks. While I will not mention every member of this hardworking team by name in this forum, lest they be denied their reward in heaven, I would like to take this occasion to thank them and to acknowledge their sacrifice and devotion in the service of our church and the Lord Jesus. And I would like to join you all to share with me the same gratitude and appreciation towards these brethren and to remember them in your prayers as well. They are as much a part of this ministry as I am. And as we open our study today, please bow your heads in prayer with me. Dear God and Father, as we turn to your word, we are woefully aware that we are unable to discern spiritual things, for we are people of the flesh. And we know, dear Lord, that sin hinders us from apprehending your precious truths. But we are relying on your Holy Spirit to give us understanding. We are relying on your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and to allow us, Father, focus on your message this, uh, this morning. We trust, dear God, that your grace will be upon us all. In Jesus' name. We are still dissecting our Lord's amazing teaching known as the Sermon on the Mount. As we have seen two lessons ago, beginning with the sixth chapter, the Lord Jesus shifts from addressing issues relating to moral righteousness to matters in regard to religious righteousness. And we pointed out that the specifics of our Lord's teaching at this juncture may be divided into three sections. The first section is the danger our Lord describes. Second, the illustrations he uses. And third, the remedy he prescribes. Last week, we looked into the danger of our Lord warns us about when we go about our religious disciplines. That danger, of course, is hypocrisy. Having defined this danger, we proceeded to examine the first of three illustrations of our Lord. We noted that our Lord chose three illustrations to address the danger of hypocrisy in religious activities not because they were the most important in and of themselves, but because they were the most important to the Pharisees and where hypocrisy was most evident. We had enough time last Sunday to cover the first illustration, which is almsgiving. So let's move to, to what our Lord said about his second illustration, prayer. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 8 says, When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, Go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard 
for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. To be honest, it is hard to completely comprehend how prayer functions within the plan and sovereign mind of God. On the one hand, you have the view which says that God is sovereign, and so God is going to do whatever He's going to do, whether you pray or don't pray. In other words, this view holds that prayer is not really that essential in determining God's actions. On the other hand, you have the Armenian view, as it is called, which says that God does not do anything unless somebody prays. So those who hold this view believe that God's actions are determined by our prayers. To put it another way, some people believe that prayer simply is a way of communing with God what He is going to do anyhow, while others on the other side of the system of the spectrum feel that prayer is really pleading God to do what he otherwise would never do. These are the two extremes with respect to prayer. And it is very difficult sometimes to deal with what is the truth. I say this because there are times when we see in Scripture that men pray and that God, as it were, changed his mind or his direction and did something that appeared he would not do. But we are also aware that God acts according to his sovereign purpose and plan. Therefore, the mystery of prayer is difficult to solve. And I am not here in this recorded message to solve this mystery. But what we must know about prayer, people, and what we must be committed to is that when the Bible teaches principles of prayer, God expects us to be obedient. Whether or not we can fathom the mystery of how it works is not the issue. Ours is not to reason why, but simply to obey. And so in our text, we hear some teaching about prayer from the lips of our Lord that is very basic to this matter of being obedient in our prayer life. I trust that God will speak to all of us in regard to the lessons of prayer that our Lord teaches in our text. Now, we must realize that the Jews had a standard about prayer that was higher than most nations. Remember, the one true God plucked Abraham from pagan religion established a covenant with his descendants, and from that time on, entrusted to the Jews the oracles of God. That's how the Apostle Paul put it in Romans 3 verse 2. And because Israel was God's chosen nation, he directly spoke to Abraham and to some of his descendants, and they spoke directly to him as well. This was not a privilege afforded to other nations and people. For this reason, we can understand why the Jews rank prayer as one of their most important priorities. Notice that our Lord started by saying, When you pray. So clearly, the Lord Jesus assumed here that his audience prays, both his closest disciples and even those who did not receive his teachings well. William Barclay points out in his commentary, that the rabbis therefore had a saying, Great is prayer, greater than all good works. So prayer was really no small matter to the Jews, and was therefore woven in the fabric of the Jews' religious and everyday life. In fact, it is said that the only regret of the rabbis was that it was not possible for them to pray all day long. But even if the Jews underscored the priority of prayer, their rabbinic tradition soon defiled their understanding and practice of prayer. The problem of the Jews' prayer lives were not caused by willful neglect, but by misguided devotion. What were they doing wrong? Well, 
First of all, prayer became formalized or ritualized. The Jews were praying as a mere ritual, something that was merely required of them. This ritual approach to prayer thus replaced the reality of a poured out heart. You see, there were two prayers that Jews were required to pray daily. One was called the Shema, which consists of three short passages of Scripture, that is Deuteronomy 6 verses 4 to 9, Deuteronomy 11 verses 13 to 21, and Numbers 15 verses 37 to 41. In the Hebrew language, Shema is in the imperative. It means to hear. It takes its name from Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, which was the center of the entire matter. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. The Jews were required to recite the full Shema every morning and evening. In fact, it had to be recited as early as possible, as soon as there was light, and before the third hour or before 9 a.m. In the evening, the Shema had to be prayed before 9 p.m. And if the Jew had come to the last possible moment for him to recite the Shema, he must stop and recite it wherever he is, at home, in the streets, at work, etc. To be sure, there were devout Jews who recited the, or prayed the Shema with reverence and heartfelt devotion. But since it was repeated twice a day, we can see how praying it could easily degenerate into meaningless repetition for any individual. A second prayer that the Jews were required to pray daily was the Shemone Eshre, which means the 18. It consisted of 18 prayers and was, and still is, part of the synagogue service. The Jews were required to pray the Shemone Eshre three times a day, once in the morning, once in the afternoon, and once at night. But as may be expected, the Shemone Eshre also became a meaningless repetition like an incantation to many Jews. Oddly, a summarized or shortened version was supplied if a Jew did not have the time to pray the 18 prayers or if they had difficulty reciting them from memory. The ritualized approach to prayer is not uncommon in our day. Some of you come from backgrounds where your prayers were ritualistic. You participated in sequential liturgy where at the right time and at the right moment, you said the right kind of prayer. Some of you may have prayed reading prayer books and things like that. Even evangelicals who do not like liturgical things have their rituals too. Just consider the formula that we say before every meal and the little prayers we toss at God that are quite meaningless. So, we can all identify with prayer as a routine, prayer as a ritual, prayer as simply an exercise with little or no meaning or significance. A second error that characterized the Jewish prayer life was the development of prayers for every object or occasion. For the Jews, there was hardly an event or object in life which did not have a formula prayer. There were prayers before and after a meal, prayers in connection with light, darkness, fire, or seeing the new moon, the stars, the rain, and the storm. The Jews had prayers when they saw the sea, the lakes, the rivers, and the mountains. They had prayers for good news and bad news. They had prayers on using new furniture, on entering or leaving a city. So prayers were offered for just about everything. The ordinary Jew therefore had to find out what these prayers were and learn them so that whenever something happened, he could rattle off the appropriate prayer for that particular event. The original intention, no doubt, was to bring everything in life into the presence of God. 
and we do not deride the Jews for this. But this again lent itself to formalism. It was therefore easy for the prayers to be uttered without meaning. The third error that characterized the Jewish prayer life was setting up specific times for prayer. The rabbinic tradition had set the third, the sixth, and the ninth hours, that is 9 a.m., 12 noon, and 3 p.m. for prayers. And wherever a man might find himself during those prescribed times, he was required to pray. While the intention might be to ensure that a Jew might remember God at least three times a day, still there was the tendency to recite his prayers without solemn and sincere thought of God. A fourth error that characterized the Jewish prayer life was a tendency to connect prayer with certain places. There were rabbis who thought that certain prayers would only be effective if recited in the temple or the synagogues. For this reason, people had embraced the custom of going to the temple at certain hours for prayer. You might recall that when the church had just been established, even the Lord's disciples thought this way. Thus, we read in Acts chapter 3, verse 1, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. The problem here is that a man might come to think of God as being confined in certain places and forget that God fills the whole earth. He is omnipresent and knows what is in our hearts even before words are formed in our mouths. I guess we have an idea of this in the Philippines. Many Roman Catholic devotees go to certain places to pray for particular needs or desires because they maintain the belief that laying down one's petitions at that place will increase the possibility of God hearing and answering their requests. A fifth error that characterized the Jewish prayer life was the admiration and preference for long prayers. The rabbis thought that the longer the prayer, the greater the likelihood that God would hear and answer the prayer. So the Jews confused verbosity with piety, fluency with devotion. Often when prayers were proclaimed out loud in public, their prayers sounded more like a speech to impress the people around them than to plead God for his favor. Sadly, many Christians today fall into this trap particularly when they are praying in public. They try to wax poetic for the purpose of dazzling people and thus grope for impressive words. Sometimes they even sound like they're preaching a sermon to God and the congregation. A sixth error that characterized the Jewish prayer life was meaningless repetition. This was a practice that was also seen among pagans. You might recall Elijah's contest with the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings chapter 18. Baal's prophets believed that their God controlled the storms, the lightning, and the thunder. But on the other hand, the same belief was maintained by Elijah regarding the Lord God. Thus, it was but fair to test who the true God was. So, a praying contest was established before the people of Israel. Now, I just love this episode. We read in 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 25 to 29, So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one ox for yourselves, and prepare it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. Then they took the ox which was given them, and they prepared it, and called on the name of Baal for mo from morning until noon. O oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they leaped about the altar which they made. It came about at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Call out with a loud voice, for he is a god. Either he is occupied or gone aside, or is in on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep 
and needs to be awakened. So they cried with a loud voice and cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed from them. When midday was past, they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. These pagan prophets had a habit of hypnotizing themselves with the endless repetition of their prayers, whether it be a single word, a phrase, or an entire sentence. They would even repeat their words over and over until they drive themselves to ecstasy and finally crumble in total exhaustion. Take note that Baal's prophets kept repeating their prayers. O oh, Baal, answer us! They did this from morning until noon to no avail. When that was not working, they cut themselves with swords and lances until blood gushed out. Elijah must have thought that this was tragic and pathetic. We all know the story well. After mocking the prophets and Baal, Elijah prayed once and handily won the day. God answered his prayer in outstanding fashion. The one true God proved himself real, and Baal was revealed a false god. Unfortunately, the Jews prayed the Shema like the pagans did. They repeated their words in a self-hypnotic fashion. They were more concerned about what they were saying and how it sounded about the incantation itself than they were about the God to whom they feigned to be speaking. A seventh error that characterized the Jewish prayer life was that they prayed to be seen by men. The Jewish system of praying was quite conspicuous or showy. A Jew prayed standing up with his arms outstretched, palms upward, and with his head bowed. And because the Jew prayed at 9 a.m., 12 noon, and 3 p.m., a number of them uh, with their showy posture could be seen in various places, in the fields, the marketplace, in the street corner, in the synagogue, and the temple. With this Jewish practice and posture in prayer, the Lord Jesus observed that many fulfilled this discipline in order to pray to gain a reputation of being prayerful. They prayed to be seen by men, not heard by God. And to the Lord, that was the major fault in the Jews' practice of prayer. He knew that if there is pride in the human heart, their system of prayer would really feed it. Now, verse 5 tells us that the Jews love to stand and pray. At first glance, that sounds wonderful. But the question is, why did the Jews love to pray? Was their love for prayer fueled by their love for God? Did they love to pray because they believed that it ushered them spiritually into the presence of God? The truth is, they did not love to pray for any good reason. Remember, we noted last week that the word hypocrite comes from the Greek word hypocrites, which is derived from the world of theater. You see, these Jews merely wanted to put on a show. They were mere actors in a stage play who were putting on something to show how holy they were. And this is what the Lord Jesus wants to address here. We may never be able to unscramble all the mystery of prayer, but we can certainly deal with the issue of motive as the Lord does here. So our Lord says in verse 5, the first part, When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they may be seen by men. Since our Lord mentions the praying posture of these Jews and the places where they prayed, it is tempting to take issue with this. However, their posture is not the essential problem, although it is perhaps a symptom. The Bible actually shows that one can pray standing, sitting, kneeling, or prostrate, that is face down. 
and our Lord modeled most of these postures himself. Nor is the place for prayer the basic problem. Remember, the Lord does not forbid all public prayer. He occasionally prayed in the presence of his disciples. Moreover, prophets and apostles sometimes prayed in public. It is not wrong to be seen praying, but it is wrong to pray in order to be seen. So the problem was neither posture nor place, but people. These hypocrites were praying to receive the praise of people, which was their reward. As the Lord sarcastically says in the last part of verse 5, their reward was the praise of men, but not of God, the approval and applause of earth, but not of heaven. Who is our audience in prayer and what is our motive? That is what our Lord is centering on. In this regard, R. A. Tori gave a most helpful advice. And I quote, We should never utter one syllable of prayer either in public or in private until we are definitely conscious that we have come into the presence of God and are actually praying to Him. End of quote. That is what our Lord is teaching in verse 6, where he gives the corrective to the notion of man-centered devotion. He said, But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to our Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. The key to understanding this, this verse is the word secret. The key to sincere prayer that is rewarded is making sure that the only eyes open to us during times of prayer are those of our secret seeing God who is omnipresent and omniscient. And because our Lord is acutely aware of the human tendency to pray in order to gain the praise of others, our Lord provides a helpful remedy. Find a room and lock the door. Find even a storeroom, which the Lord was probably referring to here, where all sorts of stuff were stored, but where privacy is most likely assured. Of course, a locked room does not guarantee sincerity and humility before God, but it is a safe solution against insincerity and pride against hypocrisy. It is hard to be a hypocrite, to play act before God, if you are alone in a storeroom with the door shut. But don't make the mistake of thinking that the Lord's primary emphasis is on location, that we must have a private closet. Rather, our Lord's emphasis is on attitude. Don't show off when you pray. That is the Lord's point. And since most of us are show-offs by nature, a quiet, secluded place will help us meet our proper objective. So, it is essential that we find a time and place where we can pray unobserved, undisturbed, and unheard by people, but not by God. For God alone must always be before our eyes when we engage in prayer. The good news is, when our prayer is as it should be, the Lord said that our Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So the most important secret that our Heavenly Father sees is not the words we utter in the privacy of our room, but the words He sees in the secret chambers of our hearts. And when God is the true audience of our prayers, He will reward us, perhaps with an answer to our petitions or with divine approval. After dealing with the proud, our Lord next trains His sights on Gentile babblers. He said in verses 7 to 8, And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. For they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. 
So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. The Lord is not criticizing the Jews here, but the Gentiles or the non-Jews. In other words, He is talking about how pagans pray. And in the heart of pagan prayer is the heaping of many empty phrases or vain repetitions. And we saw earlier an example of this with the prophets of Baal during Elijah's time. The Lord is not condemning all long prayers or all repetitions here. Remember, the Lord prayed all night, as we read in Luke chapter 6, verse 12, and repeated his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, as we see in Matthew 26, verses 36 to 46. Rather, our Lord is condemning vain repetitions where many words are thought to effectively connect man with God. And the Gentiles were notorious for this. You see, they believed that their gods had to be cajoled, uh, aroused, and badgered into listening and answering their prayers. Hence, the use of many and vain repetitions. Sadly, the Jews picked up this practice from the Gentiles. Thus, the scribes and the Pharisees used meaningless repetition to display public piety. But some may have used repetition simply because their leaders taught them to use it. Other Jews, however, resorted to vain repetitions, possibly because it was easy and demanded little concentration. So for these people, prayer was simply a required religious ceremony devoid of any real meaning. We cannot, however, point an accusing and condemning finger at the Jews. The truth is, we have all been guilty of repeating the same prayers with little or no thought about what we are saying or who we are addressing. To be sure, thoughtless prayers are offensive to God. Now, of all the privileges the Christians enjoy, perhaps the greatest is the privilege of prayer. To be able to go directly into the presence of the Lord is an honor beyond description. Thus, Hebrews 4 verse 16 enjoins us, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of God, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And we are further encouraged by the promise of God to hear us. Isaiah 65 verse 24 says, It will also come to pass that before they call, I will answer, and while they are still speaking, I will hear. To be able to speak to God, who created and controls the universe, and to know that He has promised to hear us and to answer us is a blessing too great to comprehend. When you consider the fact that real prayer is not just our sending words into thin air, but that real prayer is used by God to accomplish His purposes on the earth, it really boggles the mind. What a gift we have been given. What a privilege is ours to be able to speak to God knowing He will hear and He will answer, knowing that He has invited us to be involved with Him in the work that He is doing. Now, there is nothing that tells the truth about us Christians as our prayer lives. Have you noticed how much easier everything else is than prayer? Have you noticed that it is much easier to speak to others than God? Thus, we often share more of our spiritual problems with others than with God. But when we begin to slip spiritually, it is prayer that is first affected. Thus, one major test of a person's spiritual life and condition is the genuineness and sincerity of his prayer life. I need to remind you, however, that coming to the throne of grace in prayer will not be without challenges from the enemy of our souls. Remember, two of Satan's attacks against the Lord Jesus came during the Lord's time of intimate communion with his Father. We read this in Matthew 4, verses 1 to 11, and Luke 22, verses 39 to 46. If our Lord was attacked by the devil, 
then we will certainly not be spared. The devil will try anything to hinder your prayer life. He will try to even turn your prayer time into a time of self-promotion and self-centeredness. So how should we pray? Well, I would like to share with you a few principles. But for our purposes today, I will just cover one general principle and, Lord willing, cover the others next time. First, we must realize that believers are to pray as a spiritual discipline. As we pointed out earlier, our Lord did not say if you pray, but when you pray. He expects believers to practice the regular discipline of prayer. And like with any discipline, we must take time to do it. If we are to pray effectively, we must put aside set periods of time to partake in it. As already mentioned, devout Jews would pray morning, noon, and afternoon. Yes, the Apostle Paul tells us that we are to pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5.17. However, without set times of intimate prayer with God, our spontaneous prayers throughout the day won't be as rich and fluid. Having focused times of prayer even enhance our spontaneous praying throughout the day. We should select times of prayer and guard them. A great time to do this, apart from distractions, is in the morning. In the Psalms, the writers often uh, talk about seeking the Lord early in the morning. Psalm 119, verses 147, I rise before dawn and cry for help. I wait for your words. Psalm 5, verse 3, In the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. Similarly, our Lord often got up early in the morning while it was still dark and went to pray. We read it in Mark chapter 1. So scripture seems to point out that morning is a great time for us to focus on prayer. And we see the logic here because it is harder to be distracted when nobody else is up and the daily grind has not yet begun. Another interesting thought to consider is that we often don't pray because we feel like we do not have the time. However, we must realize that prayer maximizes our time. Martin Luther understood this. A famous quote of his is, I am so busy tomorrow, I must get up three hours early to pray in order to get it all done. Luther realized that time devoted to prayer typically makes the day more productive. It even makes us more effective at work and in our relationships with others. This is true because through devoted prayer, we invite the divine not only into our great tasks and trials, but also into our mundane activities. The Lord maximizes the time of those who maximize their time with him. Certainly, you will find this true as many others have. Second, we must also understand that prayer is often enhanced by having a quiet place where we regularly meet with God. In verse 6, our Lord calls us to go to our room and close the door to seek the Lord in secret. He practiced this himself as he regularly went on a mountain to pray. In Acts chapter 10 verse 9, Peter went on his rooftop to pray. Where do you go to be alone, away from distractions to focus on God? You know, it does not even have to be a room. It could be a routine. It could be a walk in the morning. Susanna Wesley, the mother of John Wesley, and 16 other children spent an hour each day shut up with God alone in her room, praying for each one of them. And when in the middle of a busy day, the children were all over the place in their little house, she would place her apron over 
her head to pray. Third, you must understand that prayer takes sacrifice. As with any discipline, we often have to give up something to do it. We must give up time on the internet, on our cell phones, on leisure, and with family and friends. We may even sacrifice ministry to have good prayer time. In Acts 6, the apostles gave up the time and opportunity to serve tables in order to focus on study and prayer. The fourth general principle, prayer flows out of time in God's Word. If prayer is talking to God, meditating on God's Word is God talking to us. We cannot have a healthy prayer life if we are not hearing God speak back. A one-sided conversation is never very productive. But real prayer flows out of regular meditation on God's Word. In fact, our faithfulness to God's Word is connected to answered prayer. John 15 verses 7 to 8 says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. How can Christ's words remain in us? They remain in us by consistently studying and thinking about them. They also remain in us as we daily obey them. By doing this, our prayers will be effective because we will be able to pray correctly according to His will. Thus, 1 John chapter 3, verse 22 tells us, And whatever we ask, we receive from Him, because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. James 5, verse 16, the latter part adds, The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. A righteous person is one who knows and obeys God's commands. When we do that, God answers our prayers. And this makes perfect sense. If a father blesses his children when they are disobedient to him, it only reinforces their sins. If you reward disobedience, it only increases disobedience. On the other hand, if you reward righteousness, it increases righteousness. For that reason, God blesses His children who love and obey His Word. The prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective. David affirmed this principle by stating it negatively. In Psalm 66 verse 18, he said, If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Sin, meaning not practicing or obeying God's Word, hinders our prayer life. So, real prayer comes out of a healthy communion with God through His Word and responding in obedience. Fifth, prayer is enhanced when practiced corporately. Since our Lord instructed believers to go into their room, some have thought that this forbids corporate prayer. This is not true. The Lord Jesus often prayed with others and even asked others to pray with Him. And even when our Lord went to pray, right before going to the cross, He brought three disciples to pray with Him, as we see in Matthew 26. He did the same at the Transfiguration in Matthew 17. Though our Lord emphasizes individual prayer in our text, he soon focuses on our need to pray corporately afterwards. So we must do both. Corporate prayer enhances our prayer life. For this reason, we should commonly share our problems, concerns, and ambitions with others so they can pray in agreement with us. When we don't do this, we spiritually impoverish ourselves. It's like the eye saying to the hand, I don't need you. We need the prayers of the body of Christ. When others agree with us in prayer, 
our prayers are more powerful. In our text, our Lord does not say if you pray, but when you pray. He expects us to pray, and therefore it must be a regular discipline. Are you disciplined with your prayer life? Is your prayer life as it should be? Or has the Lord touched a sore spot or two through His Word? If He has, the place to begin is in this altar, right where you are. If the Lord is calling you to a more effective and disciplined life of prayer, come before Him today. God wants to bless and use you beyond anything you have ever imagined. But everything in our walk begins and ends with the quality of our prayer lives. Let's pray. Dear God and Father, you have given your children the blessed privilege to draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find help in time of need. What a privilege! to be able to speak and commune with our Maker and our Savior. But if we have been neg negligent in fulfilling this means of grace, dear Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. And we seek your help to touch us or to teach us the spiritual discipline that would allow us to regularly meet with our God. For we know that we can do nothing apart from you. Lord, we commit each member of our church into your loving hands. We ask that you bless them. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Peace be with you all who are in Christ. Yes, your word.